Uh, dear Minister and Dean, dear General, esteemed authorities, colleagues, guests, and friends, you all. Uh, good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Center for the Governance of Change at I University, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome uh, you all to this launch event of our Safer to Borrow uh, initiative, an initiative promoted by NATO's Public Diplomacy Division and supported by the CSDN, the Centro Superior de Estudios de la Defensa Nacional, the Spain Center for Advanced National Defense Studies, and the National Security Department at the Cabinet of the Prime Minister. Hours before the Madrid summit, a summit dominated by Russia's aggressions against Ukraine, where NATO leaders are adopting a new strategic concept, the fourth post-Cold War strategic concept, it may be agreed that the core assumptions that shaped NATO's previous strategic concepts are no longer valid. War gets back to Europe, great power competition is rising, and multilateralism and the rules-based international order are jeopardized. We at the Center for the Governance of Change, an applied research educational institution that studies the impact and implications of the current technological revolution on politics, prosperity, and power, meaning security and defense, feel that it is extremely timely. This gathering of top level academics, thinkers, and practitioners, terrific and diverse uh, voices to reflect before the new strategic concept is adopted on the shift taking place in the Alliance strategic theater and the current war of aggression. They both are affecting NATO's core functions, collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security. Concerning the longer term and systemic threats, technology has not only uh, transformed the nature of power, but also its balance and distribution across the states and organizations and beyond the states. The Spanish Foreign Action Strategy 2021-2024, which was released under the leadership of Minister González Laya, recognizes that technology and innovation are shaping a new global order. The future security of the Alliance will depend on its capacity to implement, on the one hand, disruptive technologies, such as data, artificial intelligence, autonomy, autonomy space technologies, hypersonic web, weapon systems, and on the other hand, emerging technologies, including quantum biotechnologies and new materials. We have the pleasure of content this morning with an extraordinary first panel that will revolve around the ability of the Alliance to preserve the technological aid in a way aligned with the NATO 2030 initiative to foster cooperation vis-a-vis -vis China and to reinforce, at the end of the day, the Alliance resilience. As regards immediate threats, the new strategic concept will have to look at how to strengthen defense and deterrence along NATO's eastern flank. NATO faces a liquid Bauman security environment with critical challenges in the five domains of operations coming from the state and non-state actors. Hybrid warfare, cyber threats, and information operations all together are the new normal. And the example of Ukraine is telling. Our second amazing panel will discuss on how has hybrid warfare evolved integration and what role will cyber and disinformation play in the changing nature of international conflict. Let me please give a warm welcome back to this home, to his home, to Oscar Johnson, former academic director of the Center for the Governance of Chen, who will be discussing these topics in this outstanding panel. Um, to frame this huge debate, on how technological disruption and other systemic challenges alongside with immediate threat posed by Russia's aggressions against Ukraine will impact on NATO's core tax and priorities. We are honored to have General Torcal, who will offer some opening remarks, and Minister Andin González Laya as our keynote speaker, who will for sure discourse about the new security landscape, the changing global order, and the decline of multilateralism. We are extremely delighted uh, that you are both here with us today. We are about to witness a um, historic NATO summit, and we am here today uh, at the beginning, uh, building a like-minded community, which goes above and beyond this encounter, to discuss on security and defense in future and upcoming occasions. 
involving and engaging uh, youth. What is at stake today is the totality of the, of the international liberal order. Thank you again to the Alliance, and particular to you, Paula Redondo, uh, uh, for your witty understanding and quick understanding of this initiative, uh, the TSEDEN and the National Security Department. Thank you, Minister González Laya. Thank you, Gerald Dorcal. Thank you to all our incredible speakers and the nice audience big audience uh, for joining us today and making this event possible. And last but not least, a very special affectionate goes to Paula Martinez Lopez, a research program coordinator at the Center for the Governance of Chain 4. I don't know where Paula is. Uh, she should be here, but she's in charge of everything. She's there. So uh, thank you, Paula, for so enthusiastically and impeccably pushing forward and leader our safer tomorrow initiative that kicks off today. So Gerald, please, the floor is all yours. Can you hear me well at the back? Okay, that is the first point to check. So ladies and gentlemen, Good morning. It's for me a real privilege to have the opportunity to deliver the opening remarks in this conference. Its main goal is clearly in line with one of the missions of my department, that is to promote the knowledge about defense issues. I don't know if we can see the... Okay, perfect. The time is right as the latest events have awakened people's interest in security affairs. Without further ado, let's get into the issue. What date is it today? We are, of course, on the 28th of June 2022. It means that we are on the eve of the NATO summit in Madrid, where the most important result will be the approval of the new strategic concept. But today, is also three months after the endorsement by the heads of state and government of the European Union of the EU strategic compass. It is also nine months after the collapse of the Western supported Afghan government in Kabul. And last but not least, we are only four months after the outbreak of war in Ukraine. All of these points Remind me the old Chinese curse that most of you certainly know, made you live in interesting times. There is another old saying that comes in handy when it comes to security affairs. I refer to the Latin maxim, Igitur qui desiderat pacem, preparet bellum. These two quotes perfectly frame and justify this conference that I University has organized, and they allow me to highlight briefly two major ideas. The first one is pretty obvious. We are facing a very volatile situation that is a far cry from the boring world predicted by Francis Fukuyama after the fall of the Soviet Union. We are witnessing the evolution of China as a systemic rival, the persistence of international jihadist terrorism, and the re-emergence of Russia as an adversary. Today's strategic environment is much more complex than that of the Cold War. The areas of confrontation at that time were limited to land, sea, and air, with two main modes of confrontation, conventional and nuclear. Today, the domains of conflict have expanded into cognitive, outer space, and cyberspace. Defense is no longer just determined by geography. And when it comes to combat forms, we can talk about an additional form, hybrid combat. This kind of confrontation includes overt and covert military operations, cyber attacks, disinformation, and economic warfare. This is not new at all. Disinformation, terror of the population, and economic pressure have been used in conflicts since ancient times. What is relevant nowadays is that the new technologies facilitate hybrid actions, playing with the difficulty of attributing actions 
and keeping them below the threshold of military response. The war in Ukraine is a perfect example of the new strategic context and also of the role that the so-called destructive technologies can play. The second point I'd like to highlight is that technology, more than any other element, shapes the way of fighting, but it does not determine it. There has always been, as nowadays, a coexistence of consolidated means and procedures with the use of destructive technologies. And every time there is a significant technological advance, the reaction is produced to find ways to confront and undo that advance. In the First World War, the classic movements of large infantry units met with the massive use of, machi of machine guns and artillery. To avoid the stagnation of the fronts, tanks appeared. Submarines and aircraft also revolutionized the battlefield. In the Second World War, the use of combat tanks was consolidated, but all kinds of anti-tank weapons and the use of aviation in support of land operations were developed. In turn, to counteract this threat, radar was invented, whose role has never been fully recognized. Already at the end of the war, guided missiles, and most importantly, nuclear weapons appeared. In the Gulf War, advances in computing, miniaturization, and sensors, including satellites, made possible the widespread use of precision munitions, battlefield awareness, command and control, and effective integration of the different weapon systems. That is, technology allowed to reduce the fog of war. What differentiates the current era from past times is that current technological development has accelerated and affects all domains of the conflict. Advances in new materials, computing, robotics, and artificial intelligence, many of them coming from the civilian world, multiply the initial advantage for the First Nation to use them on the battlefield. The lethality and precision of the weapons available is such that it requires a sustained effort to keep armies prepared for the conflict of the present and the future. And the modern military equipment and training is quite expensive. Military expenditure is a controversial issue. I wonder if our societies are prepared to take that step and invest the amount of money needed to meet the requirements of the modern conflict. But the war in Ukraine, many of whose images are reminiscent of those of the Second World War, shows us as well that victory is ultimately achieved when the enemy forces are expelled and the terrain is occupied. That is to say, in the end, the result of the combat rests on human beings whose actions are based in on values. There are many expectations concerning the capacity of NATO to adapt to this challenging environment. We must keep in mind that the main goal of NATO is to ensure the security of its citizens and uphold the shared values embodied in the Washington Treaty. The freedom and sovereignty of our democratic nations cannot be taken for granted. Collective defense has been part of the Alliance core since its foundation. I am completely confident that the Minister Gonzalez Laya will shed light about what we can expect from the new strategic concept and about the way that a document will address Spain's specific security concerns. In the midst of the Ukraine war, there are other threats that we cannot forget. I'm looking forward to listening to her speech and the two panels that will follow it, with so many experts taking part in them. They will provide a lot of insight about the current and future world. And I want to finish by thanking again IE University for having organized this conference and also want to thank you all for your attention. Thanks.
Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, let me start by thanking uh, IE and NATO for this occasion to debate defense and security and what this must mean uh, for a younger generation, many of whom simply do not know what war is about because they've never seen it. This is what we are facing today. So uh, first, let me thank you for that. We are in Madrid. Uh, let me start with a bit of a confession. When as part of uh, the government, um, as uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, um, I approached um, Secretary General Stoltenberg uh, to explore the possibility of uh, Madrid hosting the summit. We had a different agenda in mind. It was 40 years of Spain's membership in the Alliance, and we thought this would be an important moment for Spain to look at what membership in NATO had meant for its security and defense. An incredible professionalization and modernization of its armed forces. Uh, the best example of which uh, is the speech we just heard from uh, General Tokal. But also a means to show that from this little corner on the southern part of the alliance, Spain was ready to make its contribution to reshape the alliance and its future outlook. Now, thus was 2021. Frankly, we did not anticipate uh, where we are today. An incredible acceleration of history. The return of power competition in its crudest form, which is conventional war on the continent that suffered, was at the origin of two world wars and suffered a very long Cold War. This is what, where we are today. And this is why today this discussion uh, is a little bit different uh, than what it would have been just a year ago. This is what we need to take uh, possession of as we discuss security and uh, defense today. We need to understand what risks we are facing. And we therefore need to prepare for that. That's what this alliance is about. It's about preparing to secure and defend uh, not just our territories, but our vision of how we should be able to live, which is in peace, in security, in freedom, and in democracy. That's what unites us. That's our vision. It's our vision because our history, our history, especially after the Second World War, has served as well. And we think that it's only fair that what has served as well serves to guide us in the future. So let me unpack for you uh, what, uh, what we see as risks in the horizon and uh, what we need to uh, respond to. And let me start from 2010, the Lisbon strategic concept. It's 2010. We are not in the 20th century or in the 19th century. That's a few years ago. I went back to read the concept and it's incredible. At the beginning of this concept, it says, I quote, today, the Euro-Atlantic area lives in peace and the threat of a conventional attack on NATO is low. This is the opening paragraph of NATO 2010 strategic concept. Now, fast forward 2022, 12 years later, We've got conventional war on our territory. We've got an attack on the sovereignty and territorial integrity of an independent nation. And with that, throwing away what was the basics uh, of the functioning uh, of our international system, the international order, we call it, uh, which is basically uh, a vision of rules, institutions, um, that prevent power grab, which is what we felt was wrong in the 20th century. So, with this starting point, uh, we need to look at the risks. What risks are we facing today that NATO needs to take into account to shape its answer? First, we are back to the conventional warfare, to conventional war, uh, which is what we are seeing uh, in Ukraine, and we need to be prepared for that. But let me uh, drill a little bit more on other risks that maybe we have not uh, properly uh, taken into account or understood uh, recently. Let me start with a general left it uh, with hybrid threats. 
because this is uh, the war by other means. This is uh, cybersecurity. This is disinformation. This is weaponization of migration. And let me tell you that on this and this country, we know a little bit because we have felt it. But we're not the only ones. We've seen it also in the East, and we've seen it in the North. So we have to take it seriously, because what these new threats are doing is they are confronting societies with armies. They are blurring the distinction between citizens and soldiers. And that's what we need to take into account if we are to respond to this, because the response has to be a little bit more sophisticated. These threats are exploiting our vulnerabilities on the economy, on technology, uh, on uh, energy, very important ones. So we need to be prepared for these hybrid threats. Next in line is climate change. I hear all the time many people tell me, but what is NATO going to do on climate change? It's not about NATO doing things on climate change. It's about NATO members understanding that if they want to promote security, they need to tackle seriously climate change. Because climate change today is a huge battle uh, for scarce resources, water, soil. It's crisis that creates incredible insecurity. This is what we are seeing in, on the southern uh, part of the NATO alliance, where climate change is driving millions of people that were working before, pastoralists or in the agricultural sector, that now simply see their lives with no future and have no other choice than what humanity has known uh, for centuries, which is to migrate. Next in line uh, is the China factor. And we have to be able to talk about China. Because on the one hand, we cannot do without China if we are to provide financial stability, security of trade, governance of climate change. We need China, given that it is a systemic actor. But on the other hand, we know also very well that China wants an alternative model of governance that collides with the vision that we have in the alliance about what governance should be about. Now, this is why in Europe we thought hard about what the relationship with this uh, new, more powerful China should be. And we thought that it has to be partly partner, partly competitor, partly systemic rival. Now, the question, having said that, is how much of partner, how much of competitor, and how much of systemic rival? And that's what NATO needs to grapple with. Next in line is terrorism. Until 9-11, terrorism was a national domestic issue. Again, an issue we know very well in this country because we've had it inside the country. But after 9-11, this was an international issue that also requires its part, it affects collective defense and therefore needs to be addressed uh, and needs to have a response uh, in the NATO um, new strategic compact. And when we think terrorism, we necessarily need to think southern flank of the alliance. Because this is also a very prescient risk that those of us that are closer uh, to the southern part of the world feel very acutely. And this is why, from a country like Spain, the risks coming from the southern flank are also something that needs to be inputted uh, in the alliance strategic concept. Now, this is the panorama of the risks that the Alliance needs to uh, address. And I think a lot of work has been done uh, by allies um, at NATO to unpack them and to start weaving uh, responses, solid responses, 
to address those challenges. But if I take a little bit of altitude, I, three, I see three things that NATO needs to, uh, will have to uh, confront in uh, unpacking uh, and in implementing the new strategic compact concept. Sorry. Um, let me very briefly uh, mention them uh, for you. The first is the articulation between Europe and NATO. I think we are gone past uh, the times when we were talking about duplication and overlaps and preventing, uh, uh, you know, duplications and overlaps. It's a little, the discussion is different today. Mostly because NATO is becoming more European. And mostly because Europe, the European Union, is taking it more seriously to invest in security and defense. Because we've understood that we can no longer be just herbivores. We have to be a little bit carnivore too. Not that we like it, but this is the reality of the world we live in. So we've got to adjust to what, uh, what world we live in. And this is why Europe is moving uh, first forward in defining risks in Europe. This is what the strategic compass that the general was talking about means. And this is why Europe is investing more on security and defense. And this is why I'm very hopeful that the discussion for the future is not about avoiding overlaps, but looking at how we can work in a complementary manner to exploit a more committed Europe in a stronger transatlantic alliance. And I think, by the way, that this is not only good for Europe, I think this is also good for America. And this is also good for an America that needs Europe to be more serious about its own security and defense. Number two, we need, NATO needs to look at what will be its framework of action. What will NATO, NATO's role be in the Indo-Pacific? It's a big question. And I like to um, um, go back uh, to the definition uh, of this factor called China. In my view, what we have ahead of us is a choice. Choice number one is to opt for a fragmentation of the international order. China on the one side, the transatlantic alliance on the other side. I'm concerned. I'm concerned because I know where fragmentation leads. It will make us all poorer. And it will impact in particular many developing countries that today rely on the fact that there is one international system. Now, the alternative, in my view, and this is avenue number two, is to engage with China, to open channels of communication. We had them in the Cold War with Russia. We must have them with China now, because otherwise the risks are too big. Number three, and this is the final one, uh, is deterrence. What is deterrence today? Deterrence is a, is a major pillar of the transatlantic alliance, in particular nuclear deterrence. We have seen the limitations of deterrence with war in, in Ukraine. But more than that, we will see a race on the nuclear side. We will see a proliferation on the nuclear side. We are already seeing signals of that. So uh, we need to look a little bit more closely about deterrence. What's deterrence on cyber security? How much of economic deterrence? Because we've seen also that there is a thing called economic deterrence, maybe little d rather than capital D. So NATO needs to look hard about deterrence and what it means in the 21st century. I will end uh, by where I started, security and defense matter to all of us. It matter also to the younger generation. This is why we need the younger generation also uh, more uh, interested, investing more 
to help us shape this new security and defense landscape, uh, to help us uh, by being more aware, uh, to help us uh, by uh, getting better organized, and to help us by helping us invest more on defense and security, which is ultimately what we will need to do if we want to protect our own freedoms and our own uh, vision for where we want to live, which is democracies. Thank you again uh, for this opportunity. And uh, now I sit and listen to the real experts, uh, which is the most interesting part of being invited to conferences. Thank you very much again. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, definitely lots to unpack there. Uh, lots of food for thought for our, our first panel. Um, we're extremely lucky to have five experts that actually come from all over the place. Um, let me introduce you to Katerina Gardisova, who is a policy fellow um, at the European, the European Leadership Network from London. Um, she's also a Wilson Center uh, Global Fellow and a NATO 2030 uh, Young Leader. Um, next, we have Rita Konaev, um, who's come all the way from, from DC. Um, she's a deputy director of analysis and, and a research fellow at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology uh, at George, Georgetown. Uh, we have Bernardo Navazo, uh, who is a, an international relations and, and defense analyst. As he's also an international security professor at the Universidad Carlos III. Uh, Antonio Notario, who is the head, he's leading the political strategy uh, uh, planning unit at the National Security Department at the, at the office of the, of the Spanish Prime Minister. And last but not least, uh, Lydia Vax, uh, who is a research associate at the uh, Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, uh, the German Institute uh, for International and Security Affairs um, in, in Berlin. Um, so, um, as many of you know, our center, the Center for the Governance of Change, uh, we study the impact of emerging, emerging technologies and, and disruptive technologies uh, on, on several areas of society. Um, and for this panel, we would like to explore and, and hear from, from all of you um, how disruptive and emerging technologies such as AI, big data, autonomous weapons, uh, biotech, or even quantum technologies um, but of course, as, as the minister mentioned, processes such as disinformation, misinformation, um, cyber warfare, uh, hybrid uh, threats um, are actually changing the international uh, security landscape. And, and especially how are they impacting the way NATO and, and NATO countries operate. So I would like to start with, with Katerina. And, and my first question to you would be, in what way emerging technologies are, are transforming the global security scenario. And it would be fantastic if you could give us a, a, a couple of, of specific examples to, to illustrate um, you know, the, the, the disruptive nature of it. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's really a pleasure uh, to be with you today. It's a pleasure uh, to share the stage with the Dean of SIA, which is my alma mater as well. Um, I have been focusing on um, military decarbonization and green technologies, and I would like to use this opportunity to tell you a little bit more about technological innovation and how that could help our militaries uh, decarbonize. As we have heard, uh, climate change and the security implications it causes, it's really a part of the risk matrix that NATO has been focusing on. and. At this moment, fossil fuels are at the core of our military activities. And from the operational point of view, we have seen in Afghanistan and Iraq how vulnerable, uh, what the logistical burden that is uh, for our operations, how vulnerable we are because our militaries depend on fossil fuels. And with fossil fuel infrastructure being attacked in Ukraine, we see once again 
um, these vulnerabilities. So moving away from fossil fuels makes sense, not just from a climate point of view, but also for our military survivability. And at the Brussels summit last year, um, NATO members agreed to work towards reducing um, their greenhouse gas emissions and even consider voluntary targets to reach net zero. And climate change uh, will also form an important part of the Madrid summit uh, and the next strategic concept. Technological innovation plays a key role uh, in military decarbonization. Um, so there are already some technologies that exist. Uh, such as um, deliveries by drones or 3D printing of ammunition and certain components, uh, which can offer significant savings. Um, sustainable fuels are increasingly being used too, such as biofuels and synthetic fuels. Uh, to give you one example, in 2017, Swedish MOD flew a Gripen fighter on a 100% uh, biofuel. Um, another technology that is already available and does not require market transformation are hybrid electric vehicles. Uh, and many allies are already starting to electrify their white fleet, so non-tactical uh, vehicles. Um, another way in which we can reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and reduce the logistical burden is through improved energy efficiency uh, of buildings and bases because we already have insulation materials and technologies uh, that allow us to significantly reduce emissions that are associated with both heating and cooling. And now, when it comes to emerging technologies, which is the focus uh, of this session, um, as AI and computing power uh, develop, we could increasingly do both training and exercising digitally. Uh, with 5G and space-based observing systems, we will be able to plan our operations in a much more effective way in the future. Um, so we will be able to better optimize both routes and logistics uh, with significant savings, both in terms of costs, but also fuel. Um, and also, um, I would like to say that we need to look at the industrial defense base and, supply and optimize our supply networks because military decarbonization goes beyond just the militaries, military activities and installations. It's also about our supply chains. So I think there is a possibility for our militaries to go net zero by 2050, uh, but additional investment in research and development is needed uh, because in particular with heavy weapon systems like fighter jets, tanks and aircraft carriers, we need to develop technologies that can help us uh, decarbonize. Thank you. Um, Rita, you're an expert on, on AI and military um, innovation, actually specifically Russian military innovation. So how do you think um, you know, new weapon systems are changing or will change the, the security uh, landscape? Um, big question. Yeah. Um, a little difficult being an expert on Russian military innovation when Russia conducts an operation that is the counter of innovation and counter of even basic military tactics and <laughs> assessments. Um, how are advanced technologies and autonomous weapons could influence the character, the nature of war? I think I'm going to answer this question backwards and by saying that we actually absolutely don't know yet. And in order for us to be able to understand, let alone anticipate, we have to be fundamentally comfortable with ambiguity and oftentimes contradiction. Because you currently have a set of assessments that predict basically contrary things. On the one hand, you have a very strong argument that says that the proliferation of drones and increasingly unmanned autonomous vehicles is going to be a bit of an equalizer. It is going to empower asymmetric actors, weaker actors, non-state actors, for instance, or um, you know, weaker governments and weaker militaries, because you can get that um, technology quite cheaply, you can mass produce it, and it's commercially already available. We've seen ISIS employ, for instance, commercial drones quite effectively in a way that then later on the United States military uh, said that it was the worst tactical surprise that they've experienced in recent memory in the, throughout the Iraq war. We're seeing Ukraine right now use drones extremely effectively against heavy and very expensive Russian equipment. So in that sense, 
you can think about emerging technologies as an equalizer. On the other hand, we also have a set of convincing arguments that tell us that it's going to essentially benefit the countries that are already good at fighting, that are already have flexible and smart and agile command and control system. And what it's going to do is to support the decision makers who are already good at making decisions. It's going to expedite uh, decision processes, make them more precise, but it will work better for the countries and militaries, especially the ones in the democratic world, who already know how to delegate, who already know how to conduct operations uh, effectively. And it's going to benefit countries that are already wealthy, that are already developed, that already invest a significant amount in their commercial, private sector, as well as their military R&D. So these are contradictory assessments and contradictory notions. And it's very much possible that both of them can happen. And another example, a really quick one, I think that specifically in AI, it helps, it effectively eliminates the tension that generally exists between precision and depth and scale. So when we're thinking about, for instance, the AI-enabled information operations, they can accomplish two things at once. They can target individuals at a very, very minute level. They can create profiles of very specific, not just populations and subpopulations, but individual people. So we're witnessing this almost individualization of warfare. At the same time, they're also amplifying the scale within which you can conduct cyber or disinformation operations. You can reach massive numbers of people at once very quickly. So generally, when you think about the ability to be a generalist or a specialist, they're kind of contradictory, right? If I work on Russia, I can't also work on China and Africa and, you know, Germany, because you wouldn't believe me that I know so much about all of these countries. But, you know, I work on AI, so I know everything. <laughs> so in that sense, I think we have to, if we want to understand what AI and other emerging technologies that are similar uh, in their composition are going to do for security and warfare, we just have to put our old notions and our assessments and contradictions out of mind and out of sight and think much more openly. Thank you, Rita. I think Antonio wanted to react to your well, point. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, well, thank you for having me in <laughs> such a top uh, place, not because of being on the 24th floor, but because of my high distinguished company. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, taking uh, Minister's ideas, uh, I think uh, about the uh, military weapon, there is a international system we, which was designed after the Second World War for uh, physical goods, uh, textiles, I'm taking Daniel Rodrick ideas, but not for data and uh, software. And that creates an inadequacy which creates fragmentation. And we've got on the one side this uh, global initiative announced uh, this week in G7 uh, about infrastructure and uh, digitalization. And on the other side, we've got this China's one belt, one route. M my second idea is about uh, well, technology as a metric for national power that leads to a global race uh, uh, for supremacy, I would say. So it's about technology, it's about uh, well, uh, state-of-the-art uh, weapon system, hypersonic missiles, but also, uh, let's say, cyber attacks on critical infrastructure. Uh, in this landscape, we've got spionage, which is not longer an issue of James Bond and uh, 007, but of 5G and electronic backdoors. This is called hybrid warfare. And my third idea uh, has to be with a three-dimensional concept of uh, complex interdependence which is an euphemistic way of saying uh, symmetry. Uh, we've got uh, strategic dependencies on uh, new materials, on software, on semiconductors, and that leads uh, to the idea of seeing technology as a factor of strategic advantage. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Lydia. You're an expert on proliferation. Uh, that's one of the topics, actually, that the minister raised. Um, 
Uh, it would be fantastic to hear your, your thoughts on that. Uh, the, the minister believed that a new time for proliferation is, is opening. Um, what are your thoughts on, on, on that assessment? Uh, well, thank you first um, for having me. It's great to be here and to be here with so many great um, experts. I would maybe, before answering your question, I would actually like to, to zoom out a bit to, to um, frame my, uh, my answer. Um, so I think there, I would like to highlight two very rather general points, I guess. Um, so first, I think um, sometimes this discussion around EDTs, around emerging disruptive technologies, um, it seems like the EDTs is like this external shock that is happening and that is changing the, the security context of our lives. I think we should more think of it as a, as a continuous development. So we have heard in, in the keynote speeches before that uh, there have been technological advances and, and innovations before that have changed uh, the way we live, the character of warfare. So it's not um, this, this shock that is happening now where we... Uh, we don't know how, how to react yet, but I think we should think of it more as a, as a process that we have to uh, adapt to. So um, that, of course, also makes it much, much more difficult. And then the second thing regarding technology in general, I would like to, um, well, underline that I think um, technology is not, it's not like deterministic. It's not technology per se that, um, that affects um, stability and security, but it's more about how we exploit, how we use technology, and so how technology is interacting with the environment. So it really depends um, also on us, on, on how we use technology, and um, how we perceive it, and also how, of course, our uh, adversaries and rivals are using and exploiting um, emerging um, and disruptive um, technology. So I think um, that's, well, important, is it still on? Okay, <laughs> I was not sure. Um, to keep those very general things um, in mind. And then, um, as, you, as you just raised the question, so I, I think that's really unique about um, emerging disruptive technologies, or especially unique about AI, that it, there's a different kind of proliferation going on here. So, I mean, I, I, in, in Berlin, I mainly focus actually on nuclear issues um, and, and proliferation and arms control. So, I think uh, with AI, we see that it's, it's a technology. It's actually a very broad category. It's a general purpose technology, so we, uh, it can be used for various different things. But um, it's, of course, it, it spreads quite easily, so that makes it much more difficult, and I think in order to tackle these very difficult questions of how, for example, adversaries are exploiting emerging disruptive technologies, I think it's, uh, we have to kind of rethink our way um, or our thinking um, on our approach to, to arms control and regulation. We can't um, approach it as the regulation of, for example, nuclear weapons. That's much more... Well, it's not easy. I wouldn't say it's easy, but I think it's at least the, the matter is, is rather easy to define. And here we have very broad um, technology or very broad dynamic uh, that we have to address that makes it very difficult. Thank you. Bernardo, any, any reactions to, to the previous point? Uh, I think that my colleagues have already expressed a good set of ideas, which I agree with. Um, and I was just was wondering uh, why, do, uh, why we human beings um, uh, innovate, or why we invade, or why we do science. And I think that we do science for two different reasons. Uh, philosophically, one of them is trying to understand nature, and the other one is the last of power. And that's why normally uh, times and periods of great power competition are super good and are super uh, catalyzers of technological disruption. It always came to my, come to, comes to my mind this anecdote that in 1914, uh, when the First World War started, uh, Germany went to war to Brussels and then United Kingdom reacted and then London just realized that they did not know how to do the Bosch magnet to do car engines and acetones, the chemical component. And just only that 24 hours after starting the war they realized that they didn't know how to do that and two or three weeks later they were able to be able to set a chain of production to do that. Something very similar happened with us with the COVID, with the pandemics, that we didn't know how to do vaccines. And in just 11 months, we were able to develop that very quickly. So times of necessity and times of uh, extremely great power competition uh, create great benefits for, create great benefits for technological and scientific advancements. And then the question is, how are we going to play this dynamic? If, if, as the former minister has stated, 
we are in times of the jungle is back. We are in times of great power competition again. So we are going to see this acceleration of scientific and, and technological developments, how this is going to be playing in NATO. Knowing that, and this I think that we have to take that into a grain of salt, that the interests of the European Union and the United States are quite similar, but are not 100% aligned. I think that it was clear last year, for example, in the NATO Brussels, Brussels summits, that the US delegation was trying to pursue a press statement that was very critical of China. And then Angela Merkel, Chancellor Merkel, and President Macron were very skeptical with the other statements that we do not believe that China belongs to the uh, Atlantic Treaty. So basically, this, these dynamics, though they have been converged, and now we are seeing that uh, the instar threat has increased our perception of those threats. At the very same time, we want, as Europeans, we want to have a different perspective in how we deal with China. So that means that we're not going to be 100% aligned in this issue. So how we're going to be dealing with this wave of technological and scientific, and scientific progress and acceleration within a structure like NATO that has most of our interests aligned, but has a grain of salt in some of those interests. And then, we were talking about that earlier, I said that perhaps the Trade and Technology Council, that is the way the European Union and and Brown, Washington are collaborating on trade and technology. One of the funny things about this council is that it's working super well on technology, not that well on trade. Mm -hmm. Basically it's saying that we look at technology quite similarly, and we know that it is extremely influential, and we know that we have huge threats in how it's gonna be disrupted in the way it appears. Because for example, now when you think about technology, you think that developments in technology will be done by China or by the US, which are the tech champions. But then you realize that some of the drones that you have been talking around were invited in Turkey, which, mm -hmm. as far as I know, is not a super technological country. Or some of the recent cyber warfare developments are being taken place in Granada, in Andalusia, which I would say is not a very super technological intensive <laughs> economy. Uh, so I guess that one of the things that is working very well in the TTC, in the Trade and Technology Council, that from now on I will call the Technology Council, is this idea of monitoring technologies. So this idea of having a panopticon, supply chain disruptions, uh, AI, AI trustworthiness, AI and other technology developments and how they are going to impact our economies. So, so, so yeah, that's, that would be my two takes. First of one is great power competition, accelerate trends that we have already been seeing, the technology and, and science acceleration. And then the second one is how this is going to play in an institution like NATO, which we share a lot of principles, a lot of value, most of our interests, of our interests, but we may have some interests that do not align 100%. Thank you. Um, my question to all of you is, how do we link all this to the upcoming 2022 strategic concept of NATO? Um, the previous version, which is more than a decade old, um, I think mentioned technology four times. Um, I think it mentioned once, cyber warfare. Um, so you've mentioned a, a series of threats and, and, and challenges. Um, should NATO be prioritizing one over others? Um, what is your take on that? If I may jump in mm -hmm. um, very quickly. Uh, I am an engineer for, by formation, so I studied aeronautical engineer. And then technology is something so vertical, so specific, and I think that Rita was mentioning that, that when we talk about, when we from the political side or from the, politi from the policy side, we talk about AI, and then you talk to AI expert, they tell AI in healthcare is absolutely different from AI in military systems or AI in banking or crypto or things like that. So basically, and then you look at the corporate world where you know, like I have one leg at the moment, and you see that there are mainly US-based and UK-based uh, consultancies that their only job is to monitor every single sector and every single vertical. So taking into account that we live in this area of paying a lot of attention on investment and the way technology, Rita has exposed this idea that sometimes it's very easy to come out with invention and sometimes other, these kind of technologies are very well controlled. So the way that one of the ways that we can collaborate is to be sure that uh, NATO um, has a, a strong EDT monitoring agency that is able to look at every single vertical, every single region. Nobody thought that Granada was going to be able to produce a cyber warfare solution to the Pentagon. Or nobody thought that 5G was going to be invented in Turkey in the mid-90s. Or nobody thought that there was going to be a drone produced in Turkey that is serving as an inspiration for many young engineers in Spain to do the same kind of drones because they are super easy or like uh, cheap and they have tremendous impact on the battlefield. 
So making sure that we have a TC, a Technology Council Plus within NATO, that I think that that would be a wonderful way to go in this 2022 strategic concept. Rita, any, any reactions? So I understand that we're here because of the NATO summit, and this is a monumental moment in terms of redefining the new concept. The problem, two, two problems with strategic documents. One is that they are aspirational in nature. We outline risks that we feel good that we can potentially handle, and then we prioritize in a way that we believe that we can tackle and what we decide on. But they are terrible, we're dealing with surprise. And they're terrible, we're dealing, you know, as, as you mentioned, like <clears throat> the world is at peace, so we are going to focus on ABC. Except that now Z came out of nowhere. Also debatable whether that was nowhere or not. The other thing is that, like, it's related, is that those documents become obsolete the minute that they are published. And they cannot really guide us in how we respond to those changes that come out of nowhere. And that is really problematic in the space of technology, which, as you mentioned, was only mentioned, what, four or five times in the previous concept, but the pace of innovation, especially in the private sector, is so rapid and so <laughs> unbelievably, you know, potentially revolutionizing that we are just, you know, constantly light years behind in the policy space trying to understand, let alone regulate some of those advances. So I think the best that we can do with a strategic concept is think how we can be flexible in cases of a surprise and think about different areas where we can react quickly to contain the problem that might unfold because of technological progress. Some of this precisely has to do with monitoring. Some of this has to do with understanding that not all actors are pursuing wonderful technological developments for great scientific discovery, life-improving consequences. So being very clear about the fact that some technologies are being used for evil by quite known and specific countries, and that NATO countries, which are for the most part our democratic countries, will not stand for that and will not support or enable the use of such technologies. So the point that you know, I've made 400 times already is that unless you are flexible, you're absolutely unprepared for this constantly changing technology space and, you know, the global security landscape more broadly. That, that we are unprepared. Well, because yeah, <laughs> you're an engineer, no, no, you but, think? No, no, but I agree. No, 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 I agree that we are unprepared for... Oh, unprepared. For I thought you said unprepared. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. yeah. Antonio, I think you wanted to react. It would be also interesting to, to know um, your view on how all this aligns with the priorities of the, of the European Union. Um, well, yeah, uh, I, I don't know if I agree with, with this last idea of flexibility because uh, the NATO strategic concept is, 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 is a very important document. It's just uh, 10 uh, pages, it's short, and it cannot come down to detail. But, uh, for instance, it will be very interesting to see how the new text uh, gives treatment to new uh, invocations of Article 5, an armed attack, uh, a cyber attack, a, a shooting down of a satellite, or something like that. And, uh, yeah, also hybrid operations will be something new from the text of uh, 2010. And, uh, oh, what else? Well, of course, uh, new technologies has a huge impact in the three core tasks, uh, defense and deterrence, crisis management, uh, and also cooperative security. And this is a must for the new text, for sure. Definitely. Any reactions, Katarina? Uh, yeah, I would like to maybe build on what Rita and others have said and bring this back to the topic I'm focusing on. So there is a certain, certain level of abstraction. Uh, you know, it's a strategic document. It sets 
the trend line for the next 10 years, but what matters is how this will trickle into more concrete things that NATO and allies will do. So it's important, if climate change gets sufficient prioritization, which wasn't the case in 2010, it was just mentioned, it means that it will be mainstreamed into everything NATO does at the political and military level, from, from force planning to operations, uh, from procurement uh, to exercises. Um, I think it's also important, in addition to making sure that climate change is high on that priority list, it's also important that uh, new technologies, the way we think about innovation and new technologies, that we do it in a sustainable way. And what's interesting to note here is that both the NATO Defense Innovation Accelerator, Diana, and the Innovation Fund have a green component in them. So I think what's interesting to watch is how this will translate into concrete steps concrete uh, policies. Um. Fantastic. Lydia, any reactions? Um, I have to say we're running very, you know, we're doing very poorly on, on timings. Um, maybe a last, a last intervention and, and uh, if there's, there are any questions from the public, we might be able to take one, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, but I'm going to be very, very strict on timings. Yeah, I, I try to be brief. Well, I think, as, as my co-panelist just underlined, I think um, a, a strategy paper can really just um, include a recognition of, of the fact that there is technological change happening and that it changes um, our capabilities, that it changes the entire context and what our adversaries are doing. So I think it can really just be a first step and then the rest is really about adaptation. So as Rita said, and as I tried to underline my first intervention, I think it's really a continuous process. So we have to try to be flexible and adapt to, to as the situation um, evolves and see how we can, we can also shape it. And I think there are generally two very broad challenges that NATO has to tackle. So first, this external challenge so that, of course, NATO is not the only uh, alliance or the only uh, actor that, that is focusing or that is, wants to um, uh, foster development in, in EDTs, but there are other actors that are exploiting um, emerging disruptive technologies for their purposes. So I think we have to keep track of what they are doing and see how we can be resilient against emerging threats in this area. And then there's also internal component or internal challenge. So I think, um, especially in NATO, there are still lots of um, well, uh, gaps or disagreements on, on specifics. Um, for example, with regard to AI and autonomy, I think um, Allies are not really, uh, or the, are quite, in, in some ways, divided on, on, on important questions of, for example, autonomy in weapon systems and, and the use of AI and data sharing and all that. So I think there are political challenges, uh, technological challenges that could have a negative effect on, on military effectiveness of, of NATO in, in the future. So, so I think NATO has to tackle these also as the time um, evolves. So I think external challenges and internal challenges have to be kind of the focus um, in, uh, in the next couple of years. Fantastic. Well, do we have any questions from the public? Don't be shy. No? Well, in that case, um, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure. I would, we would have loved to, to have you for three hours here. Uh, thank you um, to those who came from, from far away. And um, we now have a fantastic panel on, on Ukraine. Um, so, you know, let's, let's hear all about it. Thank you so much, everyone.
for our uh, guests. It's been very, very, very interesting. I think here the challenge we have uh, uh, with the strategic, uh, the new strategic concept has very, very many different uh, dimensions. Um, Minister Gonzalez Laya um, underlined the, the threats, and these threats have very different components, either geostrategic or functional. And of course, this very first panel uh, has uh, uh, given us a, a very uh, uh, complete uh, vision of uh, all these different dimensions and misconceptions, uh, emerging and, and, say, and disrupted uh, challenges sometimes um, uh, take. So uh, it's, it's, it's going to be great to see how this first discussion uh, gets into a conversation with the second panel where we are going to, Oscar, come and join me, <laughs> where we are going to have experts to talk about Ukraine, specifically Ukraine, and this uh, hybrid warfare we are currently uh, living. So thank you for your patience. In about two minutes, we are about to, to start with the second panel. Great. Well, welcome everyone. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, my name is Pablo Martinez. I work at the Center for the Governance of Change. Um, it is my pleasure today to welcome you to this panel on Ukraine, NATO enlargement and military technologies, a turning point in the security architecture. Uh, I have also the great honor to be well surrounded by incredible panelists, my good friend and colleague, Paula Alvarez Coutero, Coutero who's the Associate Director here at the IA School of Global and Public Affairs, uh, Mr. Jeremy Cliff, who's a writer at large and international editor at The New Statesman. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Oscar Johnson, who's Director of Frontesis Analysis and researcher at the Swedish Defense University. Thank Welcome. Uh, Ms. Paula Redondo, you may have noticed we have three Paulas in this panel, so you're lucky enough. Um, Paula Redondo is um, a program officer for Russia at the Public Diplomacy Division uh, at the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, who is also promoting this event. And last but not least, um, and all the way from Ukraine, is Ms. Olga Tokariuk, who's an independent journalist and um, non-resident fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I'm going to be like Carlos and be very strict on timings, but this is obviously a, a huge topic and a, and a very interesting one as well. Um, so this topic is, is way more focused than uh, the previous one because it's on, on certain crisis that, that had started now in, um, in February. So 2022 has not very been not been very optimistic regarding the geopolitical context, as you may have noticed. Um, since the start of the war in Ukraine um, in February 24th, um, we started to rethink our security. We have countries like Sweden and Finland requesting to rapidly join this alliance, um, uh, this so-called NATO enlargement. 
Um, we've also had an increase in military technologies, both for the good, with private actors like Elon Musk or companies like Clearview AI, who have helped uh, provide network connectivity in the country and um, other use of data for, to recognize um, Russian soldiers, um, but also uh, to harm, um, namely what has already been mentioned in the previous panels uh, with drones and the emerging autonomous weapons that no longer need uh, human lives or humans in the, in the battlefield. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to get too much into the context, but I think uh, you know it already. Um, but with this uh, security architecture changing um, rapidly, um, and NATO being more relevant than ever, what scenarios, and since I just explained the different um, profiles we have here, I want to hear from all of them, uh, what scenarios do you envision um, of this aggression against Ukraine? What, what do we have here forward? We can start with Paula, for example. Thank you, Paula. <laughs> First Paula. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, thank you for having me. Welcome, everyone, and thanks for staying for the second panel, which is always more challenging. Um, so I think I'll provide a quick overview of sort of what we've seen, where we're at, and what we're expecting in the next couple of months. Um, I'll start by saying that I would be careful with any analyses moving forward that are able to predict or know anything that is happening in further than any couple of months, right? Because I think, um, I'll quite honestly, we're lying to ourselves if we know where this war is going. Um, so we saw first phase, which was a special mission, uh, who's in, which in, the intention of which was uh, to take Kyiv and provide a change of government in the city. Um, that first phase obviously failed, uh, was not successful, and uh, was honestly, quite badly executed. Um, after uh, the first month or so after we saw that first phase sort of change over, we've seen um, Russia recalibrate and evaluate uh, and refocus on eastern and southern Ukraine, uh, focus their, their strategy now on taking that part of the Donbass uh, and sort of expand a little bit on the territory that they invaded in 2014 uh, and have focused mostly on solidifying their, their uh, holding of ground in that area. Um, we've, we've seen, for example, there's a couple of differences, right? Uh, lines of uh, supply lines and lines of communication are much stronger for that, so we don't see challenges like we saw in the first phase where you have a lot of, um, a lot of battle groups advance into the middle of Ukraine and then be completely cut off uh, communication supplies and sort of uh, be, have to operate on their own. That's no longer the case. Uh, the, the, front, the Russian uh, line, uh, Russian territory is much closer, so, uh, so you have a lot better supply. You have, um, while poor, you have a better chance of reinforcements, right? A little bit of a, uh, rolling, changing, restructuring of the battle groups that are on the ground. So that's a little bit of where we are now and what we've seen Russia, um, the point that they've sort of reorganized to be at right now. How does that change and what's happening through the summer? Uh, so we're four months into the war and now it's that inflection point where we're realizing that um, war is much longer than initially thought. You have to recalibrate to, uh, you're not, it's not the initial offensive anymore. Uh, you're going to be in this much longer. It's the same people. There's no uh, resupply. There's no rotation of individuals, right? Because the, the number of, the manpower is limited on both sides. Um, in Ukraine, because um, manpower is limited and they're fighting with everything they've got, you don't have reserves. In Russia, because they've decided not to um, declare, formally declare war, which prevents uh, uh, the formal use of conscripts. And so it's this sort of change in reevaluation. Um, and so that means that you get into a war of attrition, which is really dangerous. Uh, Russia is very comfortable with a war of attrition. We've already seen losses on the uh, about 100 people per day on, on either side. Uh, and, uh, and this is my personal opinion, but I think it's going to get much worse. 
Um, and so you have to reevaluate. Russia is very comfortable in staying in this war of attrition, and Ukraine has been fighting on the defensive, and they're not going to have to choose whether to sort of content themselves with where they are or sort of move to the offensive, which is a much harder war to fight. Um, and so that's what we're in the next two to three months, sort of that shift that we're, we're going to see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Oscar, from a, a Swedish perspective or potential future uh, NATO member, what are your... <laughs> Well, I'll start with some comments on the war. First of all, thank you. Uh, pleasure being back here. Um, <laughs> I think this war will drag on for a long time. Um, I think, first of all, I think that there's little indications that Russia in any way can stop the war right now. Um, imagine President Putin going home to his people and saying, hey, I gambled all of our uh, economic and political future and interactions with the West, and all I got was a, a little piece that bombed out um, Luhansk Oblast. Um, I think that's hard for him. Um, I think that will continue. I think uh, from the Russian perspective, there's a long history of um, mixing with ceasefire. Minsk 1 became Minsk 2. Um, hostilities restarted, the same in Abkhazia in the 90s, etc. Um, and I think the, the Russian, I think there's a lot of mirror imaging going on. We in the West, we look at Russian economy and we say, haha, they will give up. Mm -hmm. look, at their, look at the sanctions, how hard we're hitting them. They can possibly not withstand these. At the other hand, you have the Russian leadership looking at the West and saying, hey, look at the cost of living crisis, look at the uh, inflation going through the roof. There's no way that Western leaders will keep interest of keeping Ukraine under their wings in terms of economic, in terms of military assistance. They will get up on Ukraine, and I think that's probably quite a fair assessment. You can already see how far the issue of Ukraine has dropped on the agenda. Um, but I do think that Russia is facing quite significant attrition, and I think that on the one hand there's Russian incentives to restart the hostilities, um, but also on the Ukrainian side. If they perceive that they have local superiority, why will they not try to take back their territory, especially when they know exactly what is going on in the territories that are being lost to, uh, to Russia, including torture, including assassinations, including forced displacement. So, um, for the foreseeable future, I don't see any way in which uh, this will end. I don't see any uh, domestic political consideration in Ukraine where President Zelensky can say, hey, uh, we lost another big chunk of our territory, um, we've been victims of war crimes, but let's negotiate and, and forget about those pieces. Mm -hmm. um, I think now the, the war will uh, start reaching a cooler period with some sort of exhaustion, but I don't think it will be over for months or years to come, uh, going against a little bit uh, the, the speculation beyond months, but I, my dire assessment is that it will continue. Mm -hmm. Olga, you're, a, you're an independent journalist on the front line in, in Ukraine. What are, what are your thoughts? Do you agree? Yes, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me here. And in fact, listening uh, to what my co-panelist co said from the Ukrainian perspective, I can say that, of course, the perspective of a long war is not acceptable for Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. uh, the longer this war drags on, the more there are civilian victims. And we've seen yesterday that Russia is continuing to strike civilian objects. Just uh, a, a shopping mall was struck by a Russian missile yesterday, killing at least 18 people, and the death toll is rising. Uh, so Russia is behaving uh, as Ukraine officials says, as a terrorist state, it's targeting civilians deliberately and it's terrorizing the population into uh, a thought uh, that, well, uh, uh, you know, m most people do not think about like giving up or stopping the resistance, but more people are thinking about uh, maybe we should like leave Ukraine, we should like become refugees. And this is something that I think also should be taken into account because on the one hand, there has been uh, uh, incredible solidarity with Ukrainian refugees, uh, but um, I think the primary objective should be to stop uh, Russian aggression, not to offer hospitality for refugees, which is a side effect of that aggression. Mm. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, Russia's goal definitely is not occupying more, just more of Ukrainian territory. This is not, uh, you know, it's just a, a, an intermediary uh, stop on uh, its, uh, towards achieving its major objective, uh, which is uh, not only toppling the Ukrainian government, but changing the geopolitical course of Ukraine, the geopolitical course uh, towards uh, becoming a part of Western institutions, such as the EU and NATO. And Ukraine has been granted, as you know, the EU candidate status last week, mm -hmm. which is a major achievement and a major victory that is, uh, you know, boosting the morale now of Ukrainians in these very hard times. 
And I think you know the, the factor that maybe sometimes is missing from all these discussions is that uh, the agency of Ukrainians. Uh, it, has, it is something that was really surprising for the majority of the world after the Russian full-scale invasion started uh, on uh, February 24th, because the war didn't begin in, on February 24th. The war began in 2014, but it was largely forgotten in the rest of the world, a part of uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia. Um, and, and this Ukrainian resilience is still there, and it will be there, and it will be an important factor that will determine the, the outcome of this war. We've heard yesterday President Zelensky uh, talking to the G7 leaders and asking them to help uh, end the war before winter. But of course, the war cannot end with some uh, uh, unilateral concessions on the Ukraine side, as some European politicians have been suggesting. You know, the issue should not be how to avoid humiliating Putin, because actually, uh, Putin is not not concerned about the, what the internal audience in Russia thinks about the outcome of this war. He has uh, under his control a huge propaganda machine. He can sell any sort of outcome of this war. He doesn't need, you know, objective facts uh, to uh, say things that he wants to say. So uh, objective facts and truth in Russia is not, uh, is not existent for many, many years. If you want to watch Russian TV, you'll see that it's completely upside down. Uh, so uh, my point is that uh, this Ukrainian uh, resilience and resistance should be uh, taken into account, it should be supported, uh, it should not be underestimated. Also, if we are speaking about the use of technologies, Ukrainians have demonstrated that they are very good in that, uh, not just uh, you know, using the technology that they already had, like the Turkish TB2 Bayraktar drones that were mentioned on the first panel, but also the uh, latest uh, NATO weapons that have been uh, transferred to Ukraine in recent weeks. So, uh, Ukrainian armed forces uh, really in, in the span, in a really short span of several weeks, uh, get accustomed and get really, uh, you know, well, um, they, they, get, they understand how to use them and they start using them. So, this, uh, mm -hmm. the level of like preparedness and education and uh, experience of Ukrainian forces that have been, you know, uh, fighting this war for eight years and the country has moved on closer and closer towards nature standards in these years should be uh, taken into account, shouldn't be underestimated. Uh, I would want also to uh, address the issue of technology that has been used in the war, but uh, I think it's the second uh, yes. question, so I'll stop here. Yeah, just uh, in terms of time constraints, I'm going to let Jeremy and Paula react to that if you want to um, chip in for that before going into sure. the Sure, I mean, just, just briefly, I, to, to, to build on that, I mean, the way I think about the, the possible scenarios is broadly to group them into three categories. One is that Putin um, succeeds in the Donbass, is able to annex Donetsk and Luhansk, and then push towards Kiev uh, and, and achieve, ultimately achieve his goal of changing Ukraine's geopolitical course. The second scenario, of course, is that he is pushed back at least to the borders before tw 24th February this year, um, uh, which I think has to be the minimum goal for Ukraine and indeed the West in all of this. Um, a, a scenario that could see some sort of turmoil in Russia, perhaps even some form of defenestration of Putin, something I don't think we should rule out if he's deemed to have failed completely by the secure crats in the Kremlin. And then thirdly, a sort of prolonged attritional war um, fought mainly with artillery in the Donbass, but also perhaps other parts of southern Ukraine. And I think as Paola, as this Paola, uh, <laughs> has pointed out, that seems to be the direction we're going in. Clearly, the weapons that NATO has provided are not yet enough to give Ukraine the decisive edge it needs, um, particularly when it comes to artillery. There are reports of um, Ukraine being outgunned 15 to 1, 10 to 1 in those crucial battles in places like Severodonetsk, which recently fell to Russia, unfortunately. Um, I think I'll probably leave it there. We can perhaps broaden some of those points out later. Great, mm. if uh, Paula wants to... Yes, uh, thank you so much for, for having me here. It's great to be in the company of so many Paulas <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of the panelists too. Uh, so I'm not going to comment about the scenarios about the war because I don't think as, as, as NATO I should be in the business about speculating. But what I can tell you is giving you a, a very short preview of the, of the summit and the decisions that will take in relating to, to Ukraine. This summit, for what the panelists have been saying, is taking place in a decisive moment for, for, our, for our security. It was going to be already a very important summit before, of, before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but after this invasion is shaping to be a really, truly transformative event, precisely because of the impact that this, this war is having in our stability, in our security, and in the rules-based international order. It also is creating a, 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 a 
energy and, and food crisis of, of a huge uh, impact in, in the world. And this is, despite what Russia propaganda tells you, this is not because of the international sanctions, and I want to stress this. This is because Russia is attacking key infrastructure in Ukraine, is bombing uh, places where they are keeping the grain and is attacking and blockading its ports. So this is, I want to make it very clear before, before moving forward. So uh, against this backdrop, uh, NATO leaders and some of our partners are meeting here in, in Madrid and they will be adopting uh, a strategic concept. They will also be taking measures to strengthen our deterrence and defense and they will also be showing support to Ukraine, sending this message of international support and not only, um, not only a message, uh, an empty message in a way, but there will also be taking uh, some uh, some measures. Uh, we have provided already unprecedented support from Ukraine, taking of course in consideration that NATO's first responsibility is the security of our allies. And this has been the first response to the conflict. NATO has strengthened our eastern flank to avoid that the war extend to NATO territory because a war coming to NATO territory will only bring more suffering and more, uh, and more human suffering. So this is, has been our first response. Our second has been showing support to, to Ukraine, practical and also political support. We have provided, as I said, unprecedented support with military equipment, financial support, humanitarian support. And uh, in this summit that will start tomorrow, NATO allies will also agree to uh, co a comprehensive assistance package that will include substantial deliveries in other areas of support to Ukraine, including secure communication, anti-drone systems, and fuel. And over the longer term, will also help Ukraine to transition to NATO-grade military uh, equipment to, from Soviet era to modern NATO uh, equipment. And we are determined to support Ukraine all we can because we understand, as you all understand, that the stakes of this war are beyond Ukraine, of course. And then I just want to mention one quick thing on the strategic concept, if mm -hmm. I have time, because, I mean, Minister gonzalez I put it very eloquently that the uh, concept approved in 2010 is very different, uh, the circumstances, but they were also very different, not only with regard to, to peace, as, as you mentioned before, but also with regard to Russia. In that concept, allies said that they still want to build a strategic partnership with Russia. We still aspire to have Russia as a, as a partner. This is, I mean, it's difficult to believe right now that <laughs> only 12 years ago we were thinking that, but at the same time, this is obviously not, not possible anymore. We we expect actually that the, the leaders in the summit will will say that Russia is the main threat to to our uh, to our security and uh, the most significant and direct threat to to our security and. I think there will be some language there how we will keep lines of communications open with, with Russia uh, in, the, in the strategic concept. I think it's probably still being negotiated. I don't know if that part of other parts of the of the summit, but in any case, Russia will have to change their way of, of dealing with, uh, with that. And I stop here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paula, for that um, view from, from NATO. Um, as we're going to switch to the more techie part, as Olga was mentioning, and uh, Minister gonzalez Laya uh, mentioned the, the big actors in this, in this conflict, which is uh, well, hybrid warfare, namely cyber attacks on, on critical infrastructure um, and disinformation. So I would like to know what are your, what are your views, what are your opinions on how these uh, essential uh, actors in war are changing, are changing the security architecture. Oscar? Well, thank you very much. First of all, I need to um, tell you all a secret about hybrid warfare. Um, and that is that the main problem with hybrid warfare is not ambiguity. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. When Russian special forces take off a, a flag here, but keep Russian special forces equipment and go into Ukraine from a Russian military base, that is not really ambiguity. Um, let me give you another example. Uh, hybrid warfare gained popularity in the interference in the US 2016 elections. Mm -hmm. um, in September 2016, President Obama said to Vladimir Putin, cut it off, um, cut it out. And then in October, uh, everything was published via WikiLeaks, etc. The key problem of hybrid warfare is actually a lack of determination to do something about it. So what the Russian leadership did in Crimea was saying, we know that you guys are not going to do anything about this. So we're going to give you an opportunity to act like you don't know what's going on. Um, and if you don't believe me, and I'm trying to be a little bit provocative here, look at the US sanctions. 
the US sanctioned individual Russian GRU offices based on the malware they developed. Anatoly Sergeyevich developed not Petya virus. This guy developed the virus that, uh, for the OPCW hack. That's the degree of insight that the US intelligence, but also its partners, have until Russian operations. Rather, a problem has been on presenting a credible, as President Obama said, cut it out or else, which is what the minister said, deterrence. We have a deterrence problem rather than an intellectual or technological problem that Russia is doing so advanced things that we have no idea how to handle it. Um, there's a lot of things happening in information warfare, cyber warfare, etc. But I think the biggest problem is the lack of determination. And I think the good news is for this summit, we kind of finally start getting there. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there were reactions on, on this point. Jeremy? Uh, well, I was just thinking, I mean, that's, that's obviously true of the biggest example of hybrid warfare so far in the Ukraine conflict, which is the blockade of Black Sea ports and the grain and fertilizer that need, needs to pass through there. It's not exactly ambiguous what Russia is doing. This is not some gray zone. It's perfectly obvious. The question is simply, is the West and the wider international community going to do something about it? Are we going to start talking about UN-backed um, protective convoys through the Black Sea if necessary? Um, but I think that sort of hybrid warfare really does need to worry us here in Europe, especially, you know, this is potentially 100 million people at risk of famine. I think talking to sort of um, security experts, it seems that Egypt and Ethiopia are particular targets of this, both strategically crucial states, um, not least because of factors like the Suez Canal, the importance of the Horn of Africa. And of course, if Putin can sow chaos in Africa, that will rebound on Europe in migration crises, in a potentially new, new, new fuel for populists and political disintegration within the European countries. And obviously, that's something that either we can decide to let happen or we can stand up to and be robust about. Just a, a very quick additional point on, on, the, on the point about disinformation, mm -hmm. um, which is, of course, related to that. I, I've had the, the pleasure in the last few months of doing two reporting visits to Estonia, which is a country that's had to deal with hybrid warfare more than most. They had this giant... 2007 cyber attack, and I think being so close to the Russian border with a sizable Russian-speaking population, they've had to deal with influence operations more than most EU and NATO states. And they've really learned to be savvy about it. They have made themselves international experts on cybersecurity, and they've woven dealing with disinformation into their school curriculum. There is a unit that you have to do as an Estonian school pupil in the 10th grade, so I think when you're about 14 or so, which is as fundamental as English or maths or science, which is about um, dealing with influence attempts, how you process information. And I think that's the sort of model we need to look to more widely in responding to these realities. So, I would, if I may, yeah. sorry. First, I'll uh, second. <laughs> Um, I would actually go even further, and I think part of the problem is the narrative we've created around hybrid warfare and, and sort of gray zone warfare, that it's this uh, sort of untouchable, unknowable area, right? Like, what is it? We can't see it. It's a cyber attack. Can you even see it? And that's just, it's completely false, and, and, uh, and, uh, and it's missing the point of what it actually is. In my point of view, it, it's prepping the battlefield, and it's destabilizing a... a um, actors so that in, in the case that you are uh, prepping for a different attack, then you've created sort of this destabilization. You sort of um, uh, created questions as to what is happening, why is this happening, where is it coming from, right? And for example, if you look at the NotPetya um, attack, uh, uh, we saw this, it created incredible harm. There's no question as to who did it. Um, and yet, there's no possible response because was this actually what was meant to happen? Was the virus meant to have this many uh, repercussions? Uh, were they actually targeting Ukraine or did the virus end up in Ukraine, right? Or all of these are not actually unknowns. Um, and, and, and it was a very clear uh, damage and yet we're unable to respond to it like Oscar was saying because do we know, do we not know it's hybrid warfare? Was this the intention? Um, and so I think that's a very uh, problematic narrative uh, that I think quite honestly is up to states and state leaders to, to sort of push back against. And I would go further and say, uh, you know, after the 2016 election, we've sort of seen this as like something that was happening previously and something that is now happening more often. Uh, I mean, this type of hybrid warfare and especially types of disinformation, like the general mentioned in his opening remarks, have been happening 
as long as, as, as warfare has been a thing, which is always. Um, and they're only going to continue to happen. And the technologies that we have are only going to going to make them more active and, and, and sort of perpetrate them more openly. Um, so I think, you know, this part where we're surprised by this happening or we're surprised that this, it was so extensive, why? Why are we? We shouldn't be. And, and so it should be really be up to us to sort of stop that and be, yes, this was a very um, clear targeting. There are very clear consequences. Uh, we may not uh, elaborate on it as there was a uh, loss of life as conventional warfare, but there are very real consequences. Why are we not responding to it? If I may, I think another challenge to all these issues is that uh, the first line of response is not the traditional deterrence and defense that we would have with other challenges, but is the society. For example, with the issue of propaganda and misinformation, society should know. So citizens, our citizens should know if this is Russian propaganda, what are the consequences, where is this coming from? And you cannot do that if you have not prepared society for that. So this is why we call this new world that we are, world that we are repeating all the time, resilience. We need to strengthen the resilience of our society. We need to have them prepared to, to, deal with, uh, to deal with propaganda, but it's not only that. It's also about energy security. It's also about supply chains. It's also about the cyber attacks that, that you were mentioning. So there are a lot of components to, to these new challenges or this hybrid warfare, whatever, however we want to call it, that have to do with this resilience and the traditional deterrence and defense don't work as, as well with that, although maybe in the cyber domain it's, we are more, more used to that, but in the disinformation space, even though we have been suffering from disinformation since uh, forever, uh, well, at least mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking about Soviet Union, disinformation against, against NATO, but still, it's, we need to prepare our societies for, for that. Yeah, if, if I may yeah. add, uh, well, um, in fact, um, the, the Russian cyber attacks on Ukraine so far have not been uh, particularly uh, damaging. Uh, it's interesting, and we'll probably know more uh, in the future why is this. According to the reports that I had, it's also because of the work of the Ukrainian Ministry of Digital Transformation that has been like, really uh, proactively preparing for uh, this occasion and uh, transferred a part of the information on some external serv uh, servers uh, in the anticipation of Russian full-scale invasion. Um, and also some uh, examples of how the uh, technology actually was uh, used uh, in a positive way in this war. Uh, first is the use of Starlink terminals provided by Elon Musk. Well, I'm receiving uh, reports from Ukrainian military on the ground that thanks to this uh, Starlink terminals, uh, they were able to maintain communication lines between the members of the Ukrainian armed forces and to save many lives uh, in uh, the situation when Russians bombed the uh, mobile phone towers and disrupted communications in other ways. So uh, Starlink terminals really uh, proved uh, to play a, a really crucial role and help Ukraine in many ways. And another use of, of technology that is con currently underway, not just by uh, Ukrainian IT specialists, and uh, you probably know that Ukraine has a very robust and uh, strong IT sector. Many Ukrainian IT professionals are working for international Western companies, uh, and many of them stayed in Ukraine and now continue also to the resistance effort, contribute uh, to the resistance effort, I'm sorry. Uh, so um, my point was that uh, currently uh, the mm, a huge effort is underway to uh, collect the data and document Russian war crimes in Ukraine, also to identify uh, the perpetrators of these crimes. So uh, this is the use of technology that we are seeing on such a huge scale, probably for the first time in this war. And uh, finally, on the issue of Russian disinformation, I'm happy that uh, my uh, co-panelists already raised uh, the topic of uh, Russia uh, weaponizing in the food crisis and uh, trying to uh, blame Ukraine for, uh, for it, uh, while in fact it is Russia that is blocking Ukrainian ports from exporting the grain. Uh, but here we should be cautious because in the first initial uh, weeks and months of war, I heard many times and I was asked this question, so you, how, how come that Ukraine is winning the information war? Uh, can we say that Russia has lost the information war? And, uh, and I said then, and I think now that it is premature actually, in the first uh, weeks and months, we've seen a very uh, concentrated media attention on Ukraine, a lot of reporters on the ground who were telling how the things are. Now that media attention is unfortunately fading away, it is not unexpected, though. Uh, but the disinformation and propaganda machine will continue operating and will continue also using you know, the, the fact that there are less reporters on the ground who can verify the facts, who can talk to uh, the testimonies on the ground. So the Russian disinformation propaganda machine will continue operating, and especially instrumentalizing 
instrumentalizing the food crisis, uh, blaming Ukraine for that, also trying to undermine and discredit uh, Ukrainian uh, government, Ukrainian armed forces, Ukrainian humanitarian uh, resistance, uh, such as, uh, remember, just uh, white helmets in Syria and the smear campaign about, uh, about them. So Russians will be uh, operating along those uh, lines and uh, using the same tape template that they used before. I think the public in the West should be prepared for that. Uh, in my opinion, there is not enough awareness about how Russian disinformation machine uh, operates, uh, how it uses its assets uh, in the West to advance the messages it needs. There is uh, um, a lot of emphasis on preserving pluralism of opinions and uh, freedom of thought, which is I'm only for <laughs> as, as a journalist, uh, but there is too little uh, awareness uh, in the Western countries in the NATO countries um, about the, how disinformation works and that not all opinions are equal, that opinions based on facts cannot be equalized with the opinions based on uh, fake information, on disinformation and on propaganda. Thank you. Yeah. A quick thought on that? Yeah, very, very quick thought. Fully agree with everything uh, Olga said and I think that it's absolutely too early to say that Ukraine has won the information war. Just look at opinion polls, for instance, in the Middle East seeing who's responsible for the crisis. The biggest response is, I don't know, the second biggest is big bad NATO, and the third one is being Russia. Um, but I do think there's an immense difference in the dynamic between 2014, which had the reported um, deniability, ambiguity, in which Russian disinformation played an immense role, whereas the blatant invasion of Ukraine did not provide the same opportunity from the Russian uh, propaganda machinery to try to couch this in any other way that would gain credibility in the West. Uh, but in the rest of the globe, it, it still does. Thank you. I'm going to risk it and use the last five minutes to bring China into the picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've been talking a lot about the threat of Russia, but China is said to, to be identified as, the, as a key risk in the, in the Madrid uh, new strategic con uh, concept. So I would like a minute or half a minute of your thoughts on, uh, on how much emphasis should NATO put on this ever lasting threat. Can I start? Mm -hmm. Since you mentioned sure. the strategic concept. So very quickly, in the 2010 strategic concept, China was not mentioned, not even once, mm -hmm. as, if, as if China didn't matter for our security, which right now is, is difficult. I mean, obviously, China's actions are having an impact. They are the, the they, are, they have, I think, the biggest navy, if I'm not mistaken, they are investing heavily in, in military, and that is only on the military side of things. They are also, their values are very different from, from our values, at least the values that they are promoting. They are increasingly assertive in the, in the international sphere, so it's obvious that China's actions have consequences for, for us. So this is why NATO leaders will, will address China. Uh, but at the same time, China is not an adversary. Mm -hmm. We are not going to call China an adversary. So the magic formula that will come out of the strategic concept, you will see on the 30th of, <laughs> of June. Stay tuned. But in any case, stay tuned. Exactly. <laughs> but in any case, it, we need to remember that China's actions, even though they are not an adversary, have consequences for, for our security. Yeah, I think NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, whose primary responsibility is uh, territorial defense in, in the North Atlantic area, should first figure out how to win an artillery war, uh, which requires a million munition rounds. And I also think the biggest thing that NATO can do to help the US with China is uh, take bigger part of, of European security. Mm -hmm. I don't think sending the, the, the Spanish Navy to Taiwan will be the biggest impact that Europe can have on China. And I think most of the issues of handling China is outside NATO. It's about technology sanctions, it's about trade, it's about um, diplomacy. I mean, I think there are two ways of looking at the relevance of China to the Ukraine question. One is to say that it's, it's just not a relevant precedent. Um, China is a different sort of revisionist power. It has a different stake in international stability than Russia does. And the other is to say that um, there are aspects of what's happened over the past four months that do tell us something about how we should approach China. Um, and I think there is some validity to that point of view, too, on, on two particular fronts. The first is the idea that um, an autocratic power like China or like Russia is somehow invincible. We sometimes look at these countries like black boxes, scary black boxes that we can't see inside. Well, we've, we've seen in the last months, both with the debacle of the early stage of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but also in some of China's struggles in dealing with its COVID-19 outbreaks, that these states are not invincible. They're not, they have their own vulnerabilities and weaknesses. And I think we need to um, bear that in mind. And briefly, the, the second point, I think, is the importance of diversification in where we stake 
stake, stake our bets, where we build our trade relationships. Of course, we need to keep trading with China. Of course, we need to have a stakeholder relationship with China. But I think coming at this from Berlin, which has learned a very difficult lesson in the last months about over-reliance on, on an unreliable autocratic power, um, we, we, we might well want to apply that to our relationship with China, not being too reliant on it, diversifying our trade and our, our, our networks of power and influence by dealing with powers in Central Asia, Latin America, obviously a great strength of the Spanish um, political sort of and diplomatic system, um, with partners in Africa, we touched on the, the kind of potential humanitarian and political crises there as a result of the grain embargo. So I think on those two points, not overestimating autocracies, and secondly, being willing to diversify and not put all of our eggs in one basket, I think we can take lessons from Russia's invasion of Ukraine when it comes to our policies on China. Thank you. Um, look, I think um, most of the time we're too abstract when we talk, touch on these topics, right? Like, what are we actually really talking about? Um, and NATO is both a, a political and a military alliance. And so if we look at this from a military point of view, what we're saying when we designate China as an adversary for a military organization is that we're going to engage, like we, we are preparing to potentially engage militarily should it come a time to do that. Can we actually do that? Can, can, are we actually ready, should the day come, that NATO actually engage military with China? And I think the answer is no. And I think... Uh, the answer is actually questionably if the day comes, which is much more near, that we engage with Russia in, in Ukraine or closer to Ukraine territory with our own troops, are we ready to actually uh, deal with that conflict as we are seeing it develop today? And I think those are really hard questions that I think we're t we tend to be very optimistic on. And I think dealing with China as an adversary and designated as an enemy um, means that we are dividing finite resources that we have, um, creating a strategy that we may not, in the end, be able to actually defend. So I think we need to be very careful. I think China is, is very important to consider, but I think we have to be very careful on how we consider it. Are we consider it from a political point of view, on the liberal, liberal international order values that we defend? Are we, looking, are we looking at it from a trade perspective? Or are we actually looking at it from a military organization perspective and what that would entail? Troops on the ground, ships in, in the in Indo-Pacific, what are the differences and what does that actually mean? And what can we actually do with the resources we have today? Yeah, I think that China and Russia are two issues that cannot be separated completely. China is tacitly supporting Russian invasion of Ukraine. And recently, uh, its uh, uh, government officials have been even more explicit about that. Uh, and China, of course, is closely watching the reaction of the West to uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine because China has also territorial ambitions. And uh, uh, in Taiwan, you know, like in what it considers its own back, uh, backyard, uh, as, as the way the Ru Russia sees Ukraine and the former Soviet Union. So, uh, I think. I uh, think the threat shouldn't be underestimated. This is ultimately um, um, an adversary between the, democracy, the democratic world and the authoritarian world. Uh, it should be taken seriously. Uh, a year ago, uh, no one really uh, seriously took that Russia could launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Some people even in early fe February, in mid-February, didn't take it seriously. So I think scenarios should be considered, different scenarios of uh, further actions of China. And I fully agree with the point Jeremy made about uh, the need to consider uh, decoupling from China in, uh, in the economic sphere and in other spheres. Thank you, Olga. And thank you to all of the panelists. I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap up here, but you have the opportunity to ask during the cocktail after at, at 1 p.m. So I'm going to welcome Mr. Manuel Muñiz to the stage and thank all the panelists for, for being here today. Well, hello, everybody. Um, it's wonderful to be with you uh, today, and it's been wonderful to listen to the speakers and to the panelists. Um, I'm the provost here at IE University, but I also have the fortune uh, of chairing the Center for the Governance of Change um, and of engaging with its team in activities like this. I, I first want to thank uh, all of them. They gave me some notes to read, and they didn't even add themselves to the thank you, so I'm going to do it. Uh, 
Uh, right off the bat, I want to thank Irene, the director of the center, but also Carlos, the executive director. Paula, who has run this uh, last session brilliantly and has put together uh, the totality of the session. Alex Roche, who's uh, not here because he's running some of the things that we have in the afternoon. Uh, and also Lourdes Turdo, who has helped uh, run this. Uh, I want to thank all of the panelists and the people that have joined us. Uh, I want to thank the Alliance uh, for its endorsement of this event and for the work we're going to do them uh, with them moving forward. I want to thank CESEDEN, our War College, uh, and also the Spanish National National Security Department uh, for their support throughout. Um, I want to thank very particularly uh, Minister Gonzalez Laya, with whom I had the great uh, honor and privilege of working in my previous uh, life. She was very generous in joining us. She's about to shoot off to Paris as soon as this is over. Um, we live in uh, very interesting times. The general mentioned this before. Uh, the geopolitical context uh, of Europe has changed radically over the last year. If anybody had asked us a year ago if we would be in a scenario like this, I think most of us would have said uh, most likely uh, not. Uh, the world changed in February of this year. Europe changed in February of this year. We saw the first major land invasion uh, of a European democracy since the end of the Second World War. Ukraine is very large. This is a country that is larger than Germany that is under attack. Uh, over 40 million uh, citizens. So this is a major shift in European uh, politics. It is going to shape our relationship with Russia moving forward. It's going to be an entrenched conflict, both on the tactical uh, level, but also on the political level. It is very hard to imagine a scenario of normalization of relations with Russia as this conflict continues uh, to deepen, as we see very clear manifestations of war crimes being committed on the ground. So this is a structural development. This is going to shape uh, the European security landscape uh, for a long time to come. Uh, on the technology front, um, I want to share with you some work that we did at the Foreign Ministry. Uh, Irene mentioned this uh, before. Uh, we thought in a very structured and systematic way about how technology is changing global politics. We think that uh, technology and its implications constitute now an entirely new domain for global politics. So this is not just a, a subtopic on particular issues on energy policy or security or defense. This is an entirely new domain. Uh, it reminded us a great deal when we were working on this to the field of climate. So if you look at how climate diplomacy emerged over time, it began as a very technical field. People thought that this was a, you know, a subfield in the hand of scientists. Over time, it has become an entire new field. So there's an entire uh, climate diplomacy around this. And we think that that's the direction that technology is taking. And most states will have to develop sophisticated and capable uh, technology diplomacy uh, capabilities. Uh, in the space of security and defense, we've discussed here today, we, we consider this one of the dimensions of tech diplomacy, the first P that Irene mentioned, the P for power. Uh, emerging technologies change geopolitics. There's an emerging geopolitics of technology around the world. They change that because they change the balance of power, they change the distribution of power, they change the offensive and defensive capabilities of countries around the world, and they create new and emerging threats in cyberspace, in outer space. Uh, so, boy, I mean, if there's, uh, if there's a power dimension to tech, uh, I'm pretty sure that it's by now evident uh, to everybody and everybody in this, uh, in this room. Um, so, you know, I think we need to dedicate more time to understanding these things. We need to invest more in training the next generation of diplomats and of security experts in our countries. Uh, schools of public policy and IR, like SIA and SIANSPO and like us, are thinking very seriously about how we bring this into our curricula. Uh, because uh, we're struggling as academic institutions to provide the right training uh, for people coming out of our classrooms uh, to deal with this world. Now, let me end here. I don't want to take too long, and I'm between you and Abino Español, which is the worst. Uh, that's a dangerous uh, position to be in. Um, but I do want to announce something, which is the launch of the Safer Tomorrow initiative, which is what is being born after this event. Uh, this will be uh, a long-term investment from our part, from our center and this institution. It will be made up of a broad student challenge uh, for a wider academic community to reflect on the new strategic concept that will be coming out uh, in a couple of days, and also to reflect on the conclusions of the Madrid Summit. We will be mobilizing students and faculty across institutions to think about these things and to bring their ideas into how we reconstruct uh, the European security architecture and the global security architecture uh, more broadly. And there will also be a post-summit event 
uh, to discuss the outcomes of the summit. We're going to do this uh, uh, with NATO, and we're going to include NATO officials in this exercise. So I'm very grateful uh, yet again to the Alliance for their support on this. And it, this will be yet another example of a partnership between an academic institution and a multilateral organization and an alliance. Uh, we've done a few of these in this place at, at IE, and we really believe in, in, in these partnerships in advancing uh, key issues and, and topics in the international agenda. I'll leave it at that. Thank you again, everybody, for being here. I hope you get to enjoy the wine and the views and the weather and the terrace. Uh, it's been wonderful to see you, and I hope that we remain connected and engaged in the next steps of this. Thank you.